know her as over the years as a member of our faculty since the 40s and a part of the Omaha community for so long and who shared with us in the first hour, which I hope you'll all have a chance to see when you pull things out of the file in years to come, talking about some of the life here in early Omaha and especially surrounding the book which she wrote just a few years ago, Born Rich, which was so interesting and still is a joy in our home, I know. Marge, let's pick it up where we, well, sort of where we left off. We were talking about those years in the 40s when you came to the university, and then we were, one of the things you mentioned that I remember was the beauty of the campus, as you, when you'd have an uptight day, could look out from the part of the administration, beautiful building, and see all the lovely flowers and the driveway up and back. Much of our campus beauty has gone to parking now, understandably, in the press of growth and change. But you were talking about how it was when we had, well, really only about two buildings. And I think you were here through most of the early stages of change. So why don't we take buildings and then we'll probably revert to people a little bit as we go along, shall we? Very well. Uh, I was mentioning that the view from my fourth floor office yeah, was yeah. one of beauty because it looked out on a perfect crescent of green lawn on the back of the administration building. And that, in turn, was bordered all the way down to the edge of Elmwood Park by bridal wreaths, by Rhea, and... Uh, all that hill on the east side was... Beautiful entire, a veil of spirea blooming in the spring. Wow. People from all over Omaha came to see that. The uh, front of the campus, as I mentioned, was the lilacs, uh, chiefly because Omaha at that time was known as the lilac city. Mm-hmm. All these neighborhoods around here were uh, planted heavily with lilac bushes, and the parkings in the streets were all uh, centered with lilacs. What a great spring aroma uh, you'd have. At one time in the spring, Omaha was one beautiful shade of various shades of lavender. And, and the aroma. Red purple. Yeah, yeah. It was magnificent. But uh, because of street widening, et cetera, repaving the, and the freezes we had, they disappeared. They should re- really be replaced. No, but indeed so. Was, we were known as the Lilac City nationally. Now someone else has that, I think, <laughs> has that title. But the uh, campus had just one building when yes. I came, except for that wooden a building in the uh, rear of the administration. It was known building, as the shack, was wasn't it? Affectionately known as the shack. <laughs> it uh, went through several uh, changes in its life, too. It was the uh, student lunchroom, if they didn't like to go to the cafeteria. Yeah. And, uh, um, much more complete meal. They would go to the shack and have sandwiches or soup or sweet rolls and coffee in the morning when they came if they hadn't gotten up in time for breakfast. And it was the gathering place for all the campus gossip and the (laughs) electioneering, et cetera. It was the center, actually, of campus life at that time. Well, what we call now, really, the student center. Right. That's what it basically was. And then that went through a metamorphosis, too, that building as we built buildings became the book room storage, it became uh, the plant storage, it became the engineering, uh, housekeeping uh, storage, and then it became the ROTC uh, officers, offices, and uh, and then I think the traffic was there for a while. Yes, campus security. Yes, yes campus it was for security years. and traffic re- regulation, etc. And then we started making plans for buildings and for departments to move from one place in the administration building as that department had a new home in another building. And uh, All the changes there. The, the first changes actually were um, the plans for the field house and for my home ec department to move down from the fourth floor to the then student lounge. Yes, the basketball games were played there, too, weren't they, in the auditorium? Yes. Everything was in that one building. That was where the school dances were held. It was converted into the theater for the plays. It had no permanent seating. It Mm -hmm. had movable chairs. And it was the lecture hall for the large classes. Chairs were always going in and out and in and out in that uh, area. And... At one time further on, it became the scene of a very elaborate 
party for Dr. Bale. Oh, let's talk Cardinal. about that as long as we're at the uh, auditorium. That was a fantastic thing and a hurry-up thing, wasn't it? Very much of a hurry-up. He was told that they desired the ball, the after-ball party honoring the king and queen to be held on the campus since he represented the campus mm -hmm. and education as a king. And uh, we had no other place to have it except in that one auditorium. So Thelma Engel and Yvonne Harsh and uh, the girls in the publicity office and everyone pitched in and we were told we could have anything that Exarban had ever used in their Exarban balls. They had storage buildings out on the uh, Exarban grounds. If we were allowed to peruse and take anything we chose to make that room look like a um, party for a king and to hide the appointments in the room that made it look like an auditorium uh -huh. or a classroom uh -huh. and a gymnasium and everything that it had served in so all those years. So we covered all of the um, seats in the balcony with evergreen so that just didn't show seats in the balcony. <laughs> you were surrounded was, by trees. Was, yes. <laughs> and the uh, lower floor, of course, was the main uh, uh, scene of the party. So we even spread uh, gravel down the center of it, made a French garden all the way down, bordered with a gravel walk. And we had topiary trees, which um, the florist helped us shape. And uh, we had several of the women and the faculty and the faculty wives out helping to arrange these uh, strands of greenery and the balls which formed the topiary trees down the whole center of the um, auditorium. And that led to a beautifully latticed throne because it was that type of ball that year. It was uh -huh. rather uh -huh. a, uh, in rather a ethereal spring flower garden uh, type of um, atmosphere. So you tried to carry out the theme that they had uh, had during we, the regular yes. ball and so on for the party. And of course being able to bring the throne itself here from the Xarban, that helped. And then the doors that were used of the, at the portals of, of the Xarban ball were brought and covered our auditorium doors. So we had exactly the same entrance. <laughs> and this all took place in how long a time in preparation well, that is? We had, a, we had Saturday, <laughs> let me put it that way. Uh, we had a few days before Saturday where we could go around and gather all of the beautiful coffee urns and uh, uh, the service um, materials we needed for the beautiful tea tables and punch tables from our regents' wives and from the faculty wives. And we brought all that out uh, to the auditorium. And of course, Mr. Epley was very helpful at that time also. We went down to have a conference with him. Thelma Engel and I went down to ask him if uh, we could borrow some lame for the tables, the tea tables. We knew he had used them a great deal down at the Fontenelle. And he said, uh, you may have anything you like. And he sent a gentleman up to the storeroom and he said, bring down bolts of lame. He said, and what else we you? And well, we'd, need, we'd love to carry it out in exciting colors, you know, red, green, and yellow. So, it would be gold, green, and red. And he said, bring down bolts of the green and red satin also. So we had magnificent tables with Mr. Epley's gold lame and uh, yards of it. And he, I said, well, we may have to cut this in smaller pieces. Cut it up like spaghetti, if you like. <laughs> he said, just use it. And of course, he was very instrumental in uh, making Exarban a success from yes. year to year. So he was really our actual savior at the time of <laughs> converting our auditorium into a ballroom well, and it was exquisite and yeah. the service was beautiful and the boys of the men in the ROTC the officers were all in their full dress with white gloves and escorted every woman from her car to the auditorium and the women who had been going to the balls for years as wives of the boards of governors and other officers and McSarman, let it be known all over Omaha that they had never seen a party 
carried out as exquisitely as that one was, even to being escorted into the building. Wow, well, the pressure of time, along <laughs> with a lot of helpful talent, made it uh, a glorious event. Well, we had to work because it had to look good. Because well, this sounds we were like proud a great. of having it on the campus. Sounds like a great party. But then in the years when you were here, and you mentioned Thelma Engel, yeah. among others that you're going to mention today, we had some great dinners and parties that are really memorable here. Oh. That were just sort of often rather normal part of activity, they but were. they were so special. The, the campus was hospitable. Yeah. Uh, people felt that when they came to our functions, I think. And we did go all out to make them beautiful. We did it with our own flowers for a long while for yes. our decor. Yeah. You know, these shrubs that we had around here provided many a commencement and baccalaureate uh, uh, decor for us. So we had to do go out and clip them off the shrubs. <laughs> I have so many pleasant memories myself, and you do too, of all the beautiful spring graduations out in the stadium. We often worried about the weather, but when it didn't oh, rain, yes. it was a lovely place to hold an affair like that. Oh, it was it was a beautiful sight. People came to our graduations who had no one participating in it at all. You know, they just came because it was a lovely event. That's a tribute because mostly it's the relatives and friends, understandably. Right. Now, when it did the, rain, we could move in so quickly into yes. the field house. It was set, set up, up almost places. simultaneously. Yeah. And all they'd have to do is carry the baskets of flowers in for the stage. Now, along mm -hmm. with, the, with the auditorium, which we paused with, uh, you lived for so many years, in essence, in that main building, the building of the yeah. campus. And there were other interesting changes in people that you can probably recall. We talked about the mm -hmm. shack, we talked about the auditorium, but there are other changes. Well, for example, you came off of heaven, sort of, up <laughs> on the fourth floor and moved on down to where I first met you, I believe, on the first floor, didn't you? Yes, I was, I should have had, well imagined, slightly unpopular for a while, uh, or for maybe longer than that, but, <laughs> <laughs> or forever, <laughs> with no, my no. students, because I had taken for my space for Home Economics Foods Laboratory the only student lounge that was in, on the campus. And they had to move the student lounge down to the center of the main hall on the ground floor. And that, in turn, had always been just a locker room for reps. Each student could register for a locker or rent it for the semester by semester. Uh -huh. And that was the only locker room. It had no doors uh, leading to it. It had archways. And so the student lounge was moved to that with no doors protecting it and no quiet. And they didn't like that very well, and I wouldn't have either if I'd been a student. And besides that, those two um, corridors that lead to the back of the auditorium to the outside yes, uh, let in all the cold air during the winter. That's and right. I recall those <laughs> corridors that went along right. the side. They had to finally put up double doors there so it wouldn't all gush into the student lounge until such time as the student center was erected. Yes. So, uh, but they they laughed about it right it was it wasn't really a very comfortable lounge that was just a place to go and study quietly if they wanted to uh, stay in the same building isn't it true Not in your moment. memory that uh, nearly every change that happened at the university was reflected in some movement of people and then one thing led to another like the oh, students yes. the whole building really? had a change then you yeah. see we we originally had the registrar in the center of second floor hall was everything that carried on the mm -hmm. business of the university. The registrar's office was on the, if you were uh, facing the building with your back to Dodge Street, the registrar's office was on the uh, right and the and business office of the deans, the students, all that. I remember. And the business office was on the left. That lasted for many, many years. Right. Okay. And then the uh, bookstore was right, uh, was way at the end of the building where the, eventually the post office was yeah. briefly, and then ROTC. And every year you came back, you'd have to find out where these <laughs> services were because they had moved them to make possible another change for a department or a, a new service. Another thing. Uh, there, that you and I, when we were visiting, you were telling about some changes. It was in the president's office. Yeah, right. It, happened, it started when it was near you, wasn't it? Uh, I, in a small room? When I came, uh, Dr. Roland Haynes was in an office right across from my second floor classroom. And he would come in the morning with a book under his arm and 
go into the office, and I never saw him again until late in the afternoon after my last class. He'd come out with the same book. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, was a wonderful president in the sense that he was very well acquainted with the uh, state legislature, with the business men downtown, with the business enterprises, etc. And it was his job, I'm sure, to uh, create a pleasant atmosphere mm -hmm. between them and the um, university. He was emeritus well. when I came, and I think he reminded me of being a very kindly, quiet gentleman. Yes, he was a typical New Englander. Mm -hmm. He left immediately after the uh, main semester, second semester was over to for his summer home in Connecticut. So he was here mainly during the school year. Right. So when you went off to travel, he did too. Yes, we all traveled <laughs> in those. Many of us traveled in those days. But now... There uh, were very few summer classes. Yes, the mm -hmm. summer... That's, let's pause the there for a moment. The, the summer class was very small. Diminished. Though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there really one summer session, really? Uh, we really couldn't afford to have it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Keep the buildings open, air conditioned. At that time, the building... I don't know whether you remember this or not, but the building was air conditioned by the virtue of that cold spring water beneath the plant. Yeah, there were wells of spring water <laughs> right below, right. weren't there? And that serviced the entire university until we built the first building away from mm -hmm. the administration mm -hmm. building. And even then, I think the first building was serviced by that also. Yes. Now, <coughs> along with the office changes, maybe you'll think of some more as we mm -hmm. go along visiting today. Uh, there were lots of classroom changes, too, weren't there? Movements of departments oh, yes. and people, along with yourself, but <laughs> others, too. Every office changed. I can't remember one that didn't uh, wasn't altered in some way. Uh, if they needed more space or if a, a college was growing faster than another college and they had more faculty members, they wanted them clustered so they could get to each other more mm -hmm. expeditely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, we, uh, we could do... Uh, a great deal uh, more if we saved time walking around the building. That was the theory behind that, I'm sure. But it caused a lot of friction, too, when you came back and found your office in another place. Uh, unbeknownst to you, <laughs> while you were gone, it had been moved, and all your materials had to be resorted, etc. But we all succumbed. We didn't succumb to that. We thrived and laughed. Uh, it was part of the fun of the campus. In fact, some of the most, uh, what could have been the most disturbing things often turned out to be the funniest. One thing about all the change that reflected here was, uh, underlying it all was a lot of growth, wasn't it? That was yes. one of the basic reasons for it. You, and that well, you came, it was quite small, wasn't it, really? Oh, it was. Just the, mainly a number of girls and a few men. You mean the, the enrollment? Student, yeah, student body and, and staff. Seven hundred and some. Yeah. 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 And mostly girls. I said yes. six hundred and seventy some girls and a yes. hundred and some men had returned from the services. That yeah. would be a roomy main building then, wouldn't it? I want to tell you one funny thing about those returning men. You know, they came at different times. Uh -huh. And because we were growing and because we uh, weren't that pressed uh, for actual time in our classrooms uh, most most of the faculty were in. I was building a department so I had more um, class hours than most of them but these uh, men returning could come in almost any time and we took them we enrolled them and we had to make up the work with them mm -hmm. almost privately in some cases so that they could adjust to the campus and be uh, a part of that semester, whichever uh, semester they came, first or second. So any time they came, they were allowed to right. begin. And I, we all had to enroll anybody. I was enrolling engineers and mathematicians and, and besides my home, home economics majors. And of course, I had to study the curricula of those other departments because I was so afraid I'd placed them in the wrong courses, and I didn't want to cause them any more uh, delay in their education than was necessary, so I mm. studied it like I was taking the course. And I enrolled some of these students, and <clears throat> this one came to me in January, and he said, uh, Miss Kenyon, I have to change my course. I have to drop speech. And I said, you have to drop what? 
And he said, I have to drop my speech course. It's way over my head. I said, it couldn't be over your head. I said, it's where you are. And you take it from there and attempt to improve your speech and your the presentation of material. And I said, those professors in that department are there to do that with you, and they do a beautiful job. I said, what textbook are you? He said, it's the textbook. It's way over my head. I said, would you go down and get your textbook for me? We were still in one building mm -hmm. at that time. I went to his locker and got the uh, textbook. He was in a government class and didn't know he had been in it <laughs> all that time. He thought he was in the speech class. The poor man was still upset by his <laughs> late enrollment and the war, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, so I immediately called Ben Gaining over in the bookstore and I asked him if he'd take a book back that was hardly touched <laughs> and give him the correct book. Because <laughs> the poor uh, student didn't have any too much money to spare at that time. And so we adjusted that. But we made we made all these um, different adjustments at that time. A lot of in, uh, emphasis different. on individual attention and uh, oh yes, the students. Oh, yes. It was very much yeah. uh, individual well, attention. Were the classes generally small? And on our, willingly on our part, because yeah. this is the way we like yeah. to teach. We preferred smaller classes, I suppose, mm -hmm. if anybody would. And but were they generally small? We also small? liked the large enrollments later. Were the classes generally quite small? Um, yes, in the beginning they were they were uh, held to a, a very very pleasant situation in the classroom. We didn't have overcrowded classes or large lecture halls for too yeah. many courses. Speaking of lecture halls, mm -hmm. then we come to we the period the same of time auditorium. when yeah mm -hmm. when things started to change though and beyond that yeah. building. Then what are your memories of the first buildings that were added, the new one? Well, the first uh, uh, experience I had with working with the architects, et cetera, was when they were going to build the field house, and Virgie Elkin was head of the department at uh -huh, that time. Uh -huh. And he had to go to the Latenzer office, the architect's office, every morning, all summer long, as did I for the Home Economics Department. So Virgin and I were told to be there at uh, around 8.30 every morning, and we were there, and sometimes we were there, and we were there, and we were there before anyone else arrived. <laughs> but in the meantime, we were looking over our own blueprints and uh, seeing what uh, had happened since the last time we looked at them the day before. And each day we would see a slight change in them. Each day something would be sliced off, and then another thing would be sliced off. And it would start to get a little bit discouraging because something, some aspects of your plan you wanted so badly yeah. had to be deleted because of the cost. So as it went on, the original plan shrunk before your eyes slightly. The field house was to have been more spacious than it became? Not so much the space, but the arrangements wow. and the costs of the things that would have been in those uh, places, the locations, which is, I had unit kitchens. They were the first unit kitchens in the Middle West, and the public schools didn't have them as yet, and they came out to see ours after they had been uh, completed. And St. Mary's College came out to see ours. Duchenne came out to see ours. Uh, even um, Nebraska U and Lincoln didn't have the unit kitchens as now you're, Yes, you were going down with Virgil and they were talking mm -hmm. about the field house. That was <coughs> you were talking about an enlargement of your own department. Right. Ah, and a tender was working on both of them. Space-wise, space. because ah, we were crowded ah. on that fourth floor. And then we had the clothing lab, which also had to become the interior design lab for many years. And we'd go over the plans every day with Mr. John Latenzer, and he was such a perfect gentleman and such a uh, uh, very considerate person. He'd say, no, well, we'll, uh, we'll arrange it so it'll uh, look just as nice as you had it planned, et cetera, and appease us that way. But we finally got our two departments and the field house. But at the original field house, I don't think too many people 
were aware of this had the two swimming pools. It had two wings jutting back toward the back of the building on either side, the, that would be east and west. Mm -hmm. And each wing would house the women's gym and the, below that the women's dressing rooms and showers and the men's were on the west side. And a, a, another extension of the building jutting out from the center of the building toward the back was the swimming pool. And at that time, they deleted it, deleted it because they couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, it was around 125000 at the most. And now they're building that addition at millions. Yes, a swimming pool is a part of that, so we waited right. a long it's time a, for the pool. It's the same idea yeah, in a separate yeah. building now. But some of those things were mm -hmm. planned then, but they just, just couldn't, couldn't afford it. couldn't finance them at that time, but it would have saved a great deal in the future. But the field house, for one thing, as mm -hmm. well as some of the changes in the main building, really yeah. did a lot for our total pattern of oh, activity yes. here. Oh, yes, that really brought a great, uh, great number of uh, events to yeah. the campus yeah. that uh, exposed the campus to numbers of people who might never have known mm -hmm. UNO now, at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember about the time, the year in which that was all done, when it finally was used, begun to be used, when it or when it was started, was it? When was we it opened, late forties. Oh, it was. Uh, I think early fifties. Oh, so now I, I think it would have been early fifties, just about that time. Of course, Good the field of house was all, all was a dirt floor. Yes. Until very recently, comparatively recently. I remember a student. We had a portable yes. floor for many years. It could be take the basketball uh, floor up and for down the basketball and, and yeah. commencement yes and it wasn't totally covered until no. very recently but the dirt floor was a um, uh, hazard also for our commencement because yes. if there was a breeze and remember we didn't have air conditioning in the field no. house we had fans going and if there was a breeze the dust would be stirred I remember a student who used to say that was the only building on campus where you cleaned yeah. your feet when you left it. Right. <laughs> I can remember our first attempt at, at one area registration. The students objected having to go from one part of the building in the administration building to another to register for all their courses. Mm -hmm. So we decided on the campus in the administration uh, offices that we would try it all under one roof in the field house. And that was a fall of the dust storms. And we had no air conditioning over there and no way to keep cool except to keep the doors open. And as the wind increased, we had dust inches thick, literally, on the surfaces of the tables. And we had to dust every half hour or so and then wash with wet cloths the surfaces so we could work on them. The students' cards and papers and enrollment sheets were all littered with dust. And some of us had signed this from <laughs> that the year on, I think. <laughs> wow, but, what a uh, challenge to have registration <laughs> or to be a part of it as a student. <laughs> we never did that again. <laughs> we never used that uh, nope. same area again. Along but with the... Um, then we planned the student center. That yeah. was the next building. Yeah, the, the, that was the next mm -hmm. big project. That and the library mm -hmm. were... Right, uh, simultaneously. About the same time. Uh -huh. Let's talk about those two in any order that you like. Some of us who were on those committees were privileged to be on those committees because it was fun planning them. And again, seeing them diminish every day on the plans because of the costs. Yeah. The student center was, um, of course, um, to be financed by the, the, the uh, university. Mm -hmm. And the uh, library was a gift of Eugene Epler. Yes, basically. So that could pretty well follow the plans the original plans, and um, we thought it was very large at that time, and for many years. And the li library was a beautiful building. And uh, it was a tremendous I, step to get that building too, wasn't it? As far as the university oh, generally yes. was concerned. Oh yes, we needed it so badly, yes. and we had outgrown this one room. You know, the library was on three levels of the administration building. It was mm -hmm. on the second floor of the of the uh, main building with the desk and yes. the check-in, check-out. I faintly uh, remember it. The 
periodicals, etc. And uh, the stacks were down on the next two levels, way underground in one place. That's why that lecture hall on first floor is still on a uh, slanting floor. When they took it over, they, they were down so low <laughs> that they, they uh, slanted the store toward the stage end of it. Many younger Both alumni will remember mm -hmm. that room as room 110 administration has the slanting right, floor. Right. Yes. And when they moved the books, the students helped move the books and they formed a chain across the campus. And since then, I've seen much publicity about that on other campuses. They think it's an innovation. <laughs> we did it long ago. Another uh, thing that... Save we, money. Yes. Another thing that I don't want to miss as we visit today, mm -hmm. Marge, uh, that was a big thing for the university, gave us national publicity mm -hmm. and involvement of lots of people, was the time we had such a great football team in about the mid-50s, and they were asked mm -hmm. to go to Florida. Oh, yes, that, that was a triumph, not only for the football team, but for the whole campus and the yes. state, because I think at the same, the same year uh, UNL was going to Florida also. Uh -huh. uh, we were partially financed for that trip by, again, Mr. Epley, who sent the entire band and bought them new uniforms. First time the band ever had real, really professional uniforms. And the Angels Flight, which was an auxiliary of the uh, Arnold Air Force uh -huh. um, drill team, were sent, I think, 40 strong. And their expenses were paid by Mr. Epley in their uh, chaperone, which I happened to be at the time. Oh, so you got to go too. Great. Yeah. And Don Flaster chaperoned the team, and he was sent, and all the student body that uh, wished to pay the uh, slight fee for the trip were on the same uh, private cars that we had linked on to the train going to Florida, uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh, we we had a magnificent uh, trip because everybody was in good spirits and felt triumphant, and uh, the students were, I thought, very well behaved on the trip, and yet they had a great deal of fun, and coming back, they decorated the coaches with all the... Uh, mesh bags of oranges that were given to them <laughs> as gifts when they were leaving Orlando. And they were uh, very ingenious about um, <laughs> their triumph, having won the game <laughs> and celebrating it on the train uh, with all this decor. And the, uh, on the way down, the Alabama team, uh, which was headed for the, uh, a bowl game also, uh, had some of their preliminary, uh, exig their uh, uh, perhaps the referees and the school authorities and some of their uh, largest supporting fans were on our train and they taught our team and our uh, student body all their their cheers and I think one of the ones OU uses today o UNO uses today is one of the choose that the Alabama gentleman yes, caught them on uh, that train, yes, but uh, we we had a a very triumphant tour. I suppose that's just mm -hmm. another one fine mm -hmm. example. I know we talked in the first hour when you and I visited mm -hmm. about the wonderful school spirit that grew here at the university, yeah. and that certainly would have been a part of that too. And I think it built up pride. Yeah. Uh, each thing that, that was nationally recognized or statewide, or that brought prominence to their scholastic mm -hmm. uh, achievements, too. And course innovations, departmental innovations. Uh, we had some things here that weren't done anywhere else. Uh, many of the things probably have succumbed in the subsequent years, but um, we had to be innovative. You know, we had to do things in a different manner. Do you think of some of the innovations yeah. now that you recall that were kind mm -hmm. of different from what others were doing? Well, I think we had one of the first career days uh -huh. on campus. Uh huh. Uh, Which held on a campus later in, on. under one roof. Yeah. And there again, our field house <laughs> supported it. We had uh, representatives of every kind of uh, business from our downtown businesses and professions. 
uh, represented in their own booths or sections in along the entire walls of the uh, field house and we had faculty members uh, assisting them and the students were uh, it was a, a free day or two on campus as far as classes were concerned mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the students were allowed to come and talk to any or as many of the different uh, representatives of businesses as they chose to get a better idea of what they probably would follow as a career in future years and um, it brought a, a great deal of interest to the campus because many of these businesses didn't know what we were doing out here. It was a good opportunity, excellent opportunity to inform the downtown Omaha about UNO and it, uh, it was very satisfactory. Um, each uh, department also had a an area to consult with students and to hand out uh, informative um, um, pamphlets about the requirements of a major in that department, et cetera, and the job opportunities and so on. Students, I think, enjoyed that very much. I think we had a two years in succession in the field house had been pressed upon, uh -huh. <laughs> called upon to give up the time too much. I remember, I would imagine rather, that uh, there are people who might be watching this tape as they come through the alumni office or the library mm -hmm. here that uh, became a part of the Omaha business and professional community as a result of days like that. Yes, I'm, I'm sure they did. I'm sure that many of our outstanding students uh, caught the eye of many of those businesses at that time. And I know for a fact that many of those students in those first classes are actually heads of mm -hmm. many of our companies mm -hmm. in Omaha today, doing Speak an excellent job. Speaking of people, I think uh, through all the many years you were mm -hmm. with the University of Omaha, uh, you learned to know thousands of them, not only as students, but faculty and staff members. And I know you and I were visiting privately, and I think I'd like to have you share some of the memories you have of some of the very important people in your life here on campus that meant a lot to our university. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, I like I like to uh, refer to them as the backbone of the of the uh, university because they were sort of unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. They were always here. They were always dependable, and they were uh, here for so many years. Each one of mm -hmm. them, Car the continuity was great, and any of the really important operations of the university. I think that means a great deal. Indeed. I think when a new uh, employee comes and has to become a, uh, acquainted and adjusted to the entire campus, it takes almost a year to become acquainted, or longer perhaps. And at that time, we, we were almost certain we'd get the right answer when we went into an office because that person had been there. And they had been there and been there in many cases. And I think I'd like to mention some of them. I, I think, um, for instance, in the uh, finance office, there was, of course, Charlie Hoff, as vice president, was head of that when I came. But his right hand girl Friday was Vilma Titzel, who remained as manager of that um, business office for many, many years. And head cashier and did a for so long. Job, head yeah. cashier, and she was. Uh, so dependable. She always had the answer for you. And uh, there was, uh, in the food service when I first came, was, uh, uh, well, she was head of so much related to food service, the social activities and the functions for the commencement, etc. Thelma Engel, yes. who was always available and worked uh, long hours many times uh, way into the evening planning our beautiful dinners for the outside world <laughs> and for commencement for baccalaureate and for any of the business uh, uh, gatherings we had on campus and also and for the faculty gatherings too any, that were uh, just beautiful as we call them visiting firemen from, <laughs> from educational societies yeah. and organizations <laughs> and uh, 
Thelma did a splendid job and was always so dependable. And ever, even the students were acquainted with Mrs. Engel. Uh, she would help them as much as she would help the faculty. We had uh, in the cafeteria when I first came Gladys Black and Carol Graham. And after Gladys Black retired, Carol became the head, but they were both excellent food service directors. and. They had so little to work with and so uh, li such a limited uh, budget for functions that uh, their innovations were uh, a necessity and they did a superb job. Some of their uh, buffets were as tastefully done as some of the best clubs in the city and the country, I should say. And uh, there was Ruby Hogue in the post office and Ruby knew every campus member, I think, <laughs> every faculty member, and yes. had to pass the time of day with you with a smile and uh, make campus life very pleasant. Uh, Yvonne Harsh went through so many uh, uh, different types of service while she was here. Yvonne, when I came, was secretary to Dean Helmstetter. And, of course, that's the college I was in, so I got very well acquainted with her, and then she was made... Uh, uh, after that, in various at various times, she served as um, uh, instructor mm -hmm. in business administration for one thing, and employment office manager, and director of uh, job service. And in each position, she served beautifully. And as we record Excellent. this in 1979, she's still involved yes, in student she's placement still, in, she's still in the doing work it. world. Yes. yes. And with a smile. And of course, there was Ben Koenig in the bookstore. Still rolling along. And Ben moved as many times as some of the other departments in the main building. <laughs> he moved from one end of the hall to the center of the hall, and he had the center of the administration across from the auditorium for years. And then when we were building the uh, student center, of course, he was on that committee and saw to it that he had proper space for the bookstore at that time. Mm -hmm. And since then, it seemed to have shrunk with the enlargement of the student body, so he had to make another move over in the same building, at least enlarge the space. And Ben was always serving with a smile, and he had such cramped quarters. There was no place to store the books that came in, and the books that were there weren't going out fast enough. And yeah. uh, he had to uh, do a juggling act very frequently. And uh, Bob Wolf was it uh, that helped him so uh, well in subsequent years and did an excellent job and even supplied the faculty with some uh, plant uh, shoots and bulbs, et cetera, from his gardens. <laughs> and there was Jane Kemp, who was so thorough and such a hard worker and so uh, pleasant about it in the registrar's office. And many a time, she'd have to call a faculty member back and say, you didn't sign the cards. Yes, <laughs> and she's still doing that <laughs> and doing it very well. And so off the grade <laughs> list. And, You'd go at 9 o'clock at night, and <laughs> she's still working on the uh, reports. Yeah. And um, a wonderful person. And Virgil Sharp, of course. Uh, um, Jane started, uh, I think, in that office uh, under someone else's yes. uh, supervision, yes. and Virgil Sharp took that person's uh, position, and Virgil and Jane held forth from that time on. And uh, there was Hazel Spangler, who was the secretary to s several of our presidents. Yes, yes. And did such a thorough job and was always there. You could always confer with her or leave a message for the president or get an appointment with the president. And uh, see if I've... And, of course, Harold Kefauver, who was quite a large part of the backbone of the university. He, financial head, wasn't he? A remarkable person for remarkable. all of us individually and for the university. Yes, handicapped, but less handicapped than many who are not physically handicapped. No, a real giant for our school. Real wonderful person. 
and again worked around the clock. It was he who helped you with your budget for your department. Yes. And how to allocate the funds, et cetera, and very willingly. Along with the people, of which there are so many, and we're, we're just touching on a few of the pleasant memories there we have of great service to the University of Omaha and UNO. Uh, along with the people, I think part of your life, a large part of it, and I think it still continues in retirement, was your attachment to let's say, co-curricular activities, as we sometimes call it, and that's sorority life. You've been heavily involved with that kind of work. And in a broad way, that's meant a lot to you and to lots of young women, hasn't it? I think it's a very important part of their lives, too. I, I think uh, they need that uh, type of direction in social life, and uh, their actual their relationships with people off campus and in the community mm -hmm. and be of mm -hmm. service to the community, uh, build character, uh, keep within the confines of good decorum, et cetera. You, you, um, you have not time for that in the classroom, so to speak. You have a little uh, influence on them in that respect, but I think they need the outside activity. I think it's a part of campus life. I don't think you'd have a campus life if you didn't have organizations. Mm -hmm. and we had an independent organization, too, that uh, struggled for a while to gain strength, but they did build, and they represent a good part of the campus, but uh, and chose not to, perhaps not to be members of any other type of group. And they were never coerced into it, as uh, uh, you well know. They uh, had, did it on their own choosing, as did the Greeks on campus, mm -hmm. and we had uh, departmental organizations which gave the faculty in those departments an opportunity to enrich their uh, uh, backgrounds for the students. Don't you think organizing mm -hmm. and getting together and having clubs, both for faculty and staff, are just a normal part of life? Oh yes, it was, um, it was a growth of the campus too. I remember when, well, uh, some of us knew that it had to happen. And Mary Perdue Young, who was the Dean of Women at the time I came, uh, and I got together one day and said, we have to have some organizations, and we have to have some that are nationally known, you know, and that do the same kinds of things that uh, larger schools have under a different title, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's start them so they can become affiliated with these larger groups. So that started the Greek movement on campus, but it also started the Angels Fight for the whole United States. This was the birthplace of Angels Fight. It was Major Whaley and I who met in my um, home economics dining room one noon to plan how we would go about starting an Angels Fight to enhance the ROTC officers when they appeared, have a drill team and uh -huh. put a little uh, color in the ceremony, et cetera. So we gathered together a uh, small group of girls and uh, well chosen, I sure, <laughs> at the time, uh -huh. and uh, wrote a sort of a plan for the organization and a rough set of bylaws and the girls carried on from there. And they had a very active life on campus for many years and then it became a national organization. We even had uh, nationally known women uh, uh, appear who were aviators in their own right on this campus to stir interest in it. We invited uh -huh. them for banquet speak as ba banquet speakers, et cetera. And then we also um, started Waakaya as an embryonic uh, group to become mortarboard. And we were almost at that stage when something happened to disrupt the entire plan. But we never have gone national with Waakai, and I think it has since uh, deteriorated on the campus, but we were trying to really become a part of the national organizations that compared to the 
small groups yeah. we were fostering on this campus. You were involved in the beginnings of so many student uh -huh. and other groups here. You were awfully busy over and above those many hours you I taught, Marge. I think at one time I yeah. was the sponsor, the sole sponsor, for about eight groups, a different interest on campus. <laughs> and then along with that, all those committee assignments and building and other things, you really yeah. were go, 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 weren't you? Well, the reason I was always on the building committee is because I was in interior design. I'm sure that was the reason. Uh -huh. And home economics, I should have been quite practical about them. But I saw them sliced down to nubbins in some cases, much to my disappointment, because the, the um, student center had very elaborate plans to begin with. The whole third floor was to have been um, meeting rooms. It, each each Greek organization and each very well uh, organized organization on campus was to have a suite of rooms of their own with a kitchenette and a large uh, meeting room and perhaps a uh, smaller conference room. And then one large room at the end of the building for a large entertainment center for a ball or a banquet or whatever they chose. And even a terrace at one time around the top of the building, which could have been uh, uh, covered with imitation grass if necessary and had plants along the edges like penthouses have time. And that got sliced off. And then the third floor became a very utilitarian, adjustable, one large lounge that could become various things at one end of the hall. And a, smaller one at the other end of the hall, which has since become a small dining room at times mm -hmm. with a kitchenette called the tower joining it, now. and the dumb waiter goes down to the kitchen service area, which was good planning, too, at the time. But that was to serve these organizations originally. Yes. And then the rooms had to be kept just bare rooms so that they could be converted into classrooms whenever needed, which and they are doing. At the times they were. They're right? very flexible yes. now that yeah. way. They're still meeting rooms and classrooms. But they have the advantage now of having been carpeted and painted different uh, colors. The walls are yeah. kept rather interesting now. <laughs> they weren't then, but... Uh, yes, there have been a number of changes in that And building. we saw the, uh, the area downstairs altered many, many ways also. The dining areas and the sizes of them and the bookstore area and the the student uh, lounge around the informal dining areas downstairs, and we had bowling alleys originally. Mm -hmm. you remember that? Yes. And the bowling alleys have become what, part of the billiard room now? Well, I think uh, actually they're, yes, part mm -hmm. of the billiard room, basically. Yes. But that was a, um, a lower area. The bowling alleys were down two or three steps from the main area. Yes, we went down. Mm -hmm. Actually, other student services are in that general area, too. Right. They're making good use of a lot of areas that they just had to take for other things. Yeah. Marge, we have four or five minutes left on mm -hmm. this tape we're working with right now, and you were with the university in an active capacity for so long as a teacher, an administrator, a committee member, a, mm -hmm. a sorority leader, and on and on. Um, what about it as you look back? if you could capsulize it, was the most satisfying thing of being a teacher here or anywhere else, and you were elsewhere too. The quality of student we turned out has given me the greatest pleasure, I think. They're really very representative Omahans at this time. Every time I pick up a paper, there is somebody leading something who sat in my first class or my fifth class <laughs> this year or on throughout the number of years I've been here, the associations with those families. It's nice to teach. I didn't think I ever wanted to teach again, as I told you when I came yes, here. I came, yes. to, came at one to tell him I still didn't want the job, and I started teaching that afternoon at three. Those <laughs> students didn't even have a free day. But then <laughs> I stayed because I was enjoying the association with the types of mostly girl students I had then who came here and their families. We were a family on this campus. We had that spirit right from the beginning. We all knew each other. All the parents knew all the faculty. Faculty knew all the parents if they chose to. And 
for instance, when we went on the, on the Tangerine Bowl trip, we had many of the parents with us. Some of the parents never missed a football game, as you well know. And that spirit held up to our, all those years, even with all the changes on the campus and with all the uh, colleges breaking down to different colleges. You know, applied arts became engineering and uh, Yes, departments forward into other things. And, yeah. and many, many yeah. uh, other changes in those um, administrative areas. But uh, you live in a community then of your friends. I have friends through the university every place I go in Omaha. And my sisters used to become a little irritated when they go shopping with me because I never got to do the shopping. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you go to a mall, it's one friend after the other. And it's fun for me, but it was a little disturbing for them to wait for me. <laughs> because they, one of them taught away from home and one was an attorney and she didn't have any close connection with the campus except through me. It sounds as though one but, of the main thing were all the people. But today it's my it's my family. Yeah. Omaha is yeah. my family, my university family. 